church, not just Christians, but disciples. And so I spent most of my day yesterday here at the church <clears throat> a couple different times. And then I went home and, and I spent the rest of the evening, 7.30 or so, with the family and went to bed. And then I, I'm laying in bed and the Lord starts speaking to my heart and, and he starts just downloading these other things to my heart. And I'm like, Lord, that's great. I'm tired. And I, I pray this prayer. I don't know if you ever prayed this before when the Lord has spoken to you because you don't want to get out of bed maybe. Will you remind me and I'll write it down in the morning. <laughs> and so I'm laying there. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's another great example, Lord Jesus. Please remind me, Holy Spirit. I write it down in the morning. Well, it's like 1245. And if you know me, I've, I've been in bed since 1015. And so um, the Lord wouldn't leave me alone. So I finally got up and I, I wrote this stuff down. So that was delayed obedience, which is probably disobedience. I've taught my kids that. So anyway, but the Lord is gracious. But he just kept speaking to me, and, 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 and he wouldn't stop. He wouldn't let it go. And so I, I finally wrote it down. And as soon as I wrote it down, and, and I texted it. I was laying in bed, and I was, I was texting my notes, which make no sense because everything's misspelled. So I didn't have my glasses on. And, and then he let me, let me go to sleep. And then I woke up this morning, and I came into my office, and I rewrote a third set of notes. And so... Sorry, uh, as I read today, try to read my own notes. This is very unusual, as if you know me, to have handwritten notes and on paper like this. But that's where, that's where I believe the Lord is going. And I think that a few weeks ago on December 31st, which was New Year's Eve, obviously, I share with you about our culture changing here at Spirit of Life Church. I encourage you to respond to the word, that we don't have to be quiet and silent, that this isn't to be a, a funeral home atmosphere. This is to be the spirit of life. At, here at Spirit of Life. And in that life is joy, and in that life is peace, and in that life is comfort, because it is the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we engage in the Word, and as we respond to the Word, we have a role to play in our being disciples. And I share with you, out of John 14, about doing greater things. And, and we all want to do the greater things, and we want to see the greater things. Or if you don't, then something's wrong with you then that means you're content with your life in the way it is right now. And if, if that's the case, then two things are true. One, something is wrong with you because there's not a hunger or desire for more. Or number two, your life is perfect. Come up here and preach and pray for all of us because we need that. Those are the two options, right? And so wanting to do the greater things, wanting to see the Lord move, wanting to see the dead raised and the sick healed and the, those who are oppressed, freed, and delivered, and those who are walking in shame and guilt and condemnation, purified and cleansed. All right, this is Matthew 10, 7 and 8. It's preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul calls it. And we are to be doing these things, but that takes one kind of person. There's a condition on doing greater things, and that is being his disciple. And I spoke with you on December 31st about one way that we are to be his disciple is the Lord Jesus said, you want to come be with me? They came to him in John chapter 12, and he said, we want to see Jesus. So that was a good start, wanting to see Jesus. And then Jesus responds to them wanting to see him by saying, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. How do we see Jesus? One way of being his disciples, denying ourselves. So that was what we spoke about on December 31st. And then as the Lord was speaking to me in, in, my, in my bed, I didn't really see how it was tied together with discipleship. But if we go to Mark chapter 4, uh, hopefully you can read some of those scriptures. I'm not sure. But Mark chapter 4, uh, we, we know this well. This is the parable of the sower, of the, of the seed. I spoke to the wisest man that I know once, and I've spoken to him many times. And I was, I was talking about this very thing about discipleship, and it's sad because he, he looked at me, and he said very clearly, he goes, Kenny, I love you, and I hear your heart. But I want you to know that most people don't desire to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus. They are actually fewer and farther between than they should be. Because most of us, uh, most of us are content with where we're at because we have the things that supply for our needs. When we don't have those things that supply for our needs, we reach out to the Lord more. We reach out for counsel more. We, we, we seek Him a little harder than we used to. One pastor put it like this, the disease of America is the disease of having enough. So we don't have that want, we don't have that desire, because ultimately there will be another paycheck, ultimately somebody will help us out, 
ultimately things will work out. But if we want to be a disciple, there are certain things that we need to do. And one of those, as a culture, as Spirit of Life Church, is increasing our hunger and thirst for the Lord. To be His disciple, truly. But before that, one way that that is seen is here in Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verse 4, says, It came to pass... Well, let's just start with verse 1. And Jesus began to teach by the seaside, and there were gathered unto him a great multitude of people. So he entered a ship, and he sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things and parables, and said to them in his teaching, Listen, behold. In other words, pay very close attention to what I'm about ready to tell you. Because he goes on to say, if you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand any parable. He said, there went forth a sower to sow seed. And then in verse 4, he says, it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And the birds of the air came and devoured it up. Some fell by the wayside. And I was like, okay, the wayside. What does that mean that some fell by the wayside? You and I have a responsibility to prepare ourselves to receive the word of the Lord. It is said through study that people remember 5%, 5% of a typical sermon. Now, that's a little disheartening for someone who gives a, a message or a sermon because I spend a lot more than 5% of my time <laughs> on giving that to you. But the truth of reality is that 5% is going to be remembered. That means that the other 95% of what I'm saying up here is just for me to feel good about myself or to show that I've been studied or whatever it may be. I don't know. That's not my heart or my intention. But you're not going to retain it all. So what is the 5% that you've come to receive today? Now, my hope and desire is that it's more than 5% here, that you're taking notes, and then it's not for the sake of taking notes. You'll go back and look over those. You'll pray over those. You'll go back through the scriptures. You'll allow the Lord, you'll be good ground in your heart that the seed is sown into, that it will bear fruit in your life. But 5% is a very small number. And I believe that the, not, it's the 5% is because it's sown on the wayside. Well, what does the wayside mean? The wayside, the word, when you look it up, means this. It is a traveled road. It doesn't mean it's far off out of the way. It is a traveled road. In other words, there's nothing special about it. It is something that is on your journey, the road you take every single day. It's not a place that is set apart that has significant value. It is just what you do all the time. You and I have responsibilities to prepare our hearts to receive the word of the Lord, to not be wayside ground. In other words, when we come in here, there should be an honor given, a place given to the word of the Lord. Why? Because it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that changes souls. It is, it is the very power of God to those who believe. And so when we're coming in here, are we preparing our hearts when we come in here throughout the week? This is why on Sunday mornings we have a time of prayer, a time of worship before a time of prayer before and worship. You're like, well, why do we do that at 9.15? Which, by the way, I would like to encourage and welcome you all to come at 9.15. You're like, well, I don't want to worship an extra half an hour. Think of it this way. It is a, it is a holy consecration coming to prepare yourself to receive the word of God. It is a time for you to come to take the road that you normally travel on, the wayside, to put it aside until Monday when you got to get back on that road and go back to work and deal with the same issues you've been dealing with. And you put yourself on another path, his path. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And so you're coming here and you're focusing yourself on he who is the way. And you're preparing your heart to receive his word. So it would be grafted into you that your life would be changed and you could become his disciple, not a church goer, not a church attendee. I love that you all come to church here. In fact, I wish more people would come to church here. I wish more people would be in church in general, but churches that preach and teach the word of God, churches that worship not a band or the best sounding musicians in the world that are professional, but worship the Lord Jesus Christ at his feet, regardless of the band. Regardless if any music is played at all, worship is not music. Worship is a heart posture before the Lord of adoration. And so 
we have responsibility as disciples to come and to not be on the wayside, to not be just going through the motions and, and checking off the religious box. We have the responsibility as Christians who long to be disciples to come and prepare and consecrate ourselves to receive his word. And then and only then will his word be honored and given the place that it is because he is his word and our lives would be changed and we would see him rightly. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6 says this. Blessed are those which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. A disciple is a hungry one. When Jesus Christ was speaking this, they knew something of hunger. The average salary was 27 cents a week when this was written. Or maybe not written, but when he spoke this. 27 cents a week. That's pretty small. Now, I know there's been inflation since then, just a little bit. Most families had meat once a week, if at all. So they weren't vegetarians by choice. They were vegetarians by necessity. They couldn't afford meat. So when he's saying to them, blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty, he was speaking to a hungry and thirsty generation. Not after him, after the natural. But he's saying, after righteousness are you hungry and thirsty. After the things that are right in the sight of God. And in fact, it says in 2 Corinthians that we are made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He has become unto us, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 says, our righteousness, our redemption, our sanctification, our wisdom. Christ is these things to us. Are we hungry and thirsty for him who is our righteousness? To be a disciple of Christ, not only must we carry our cross, that was step one. Step two is we must be hungry and thirsty for righteousness, and then we shall be filled. You have an issue in your life. I have an issue in my life. We're already filled with other things. We're already full of the things of the world. We're full of the things of our family. We're full of the things of our jobs. We're full of the things of our leisure. We're full of the things of our wealth. We're full of the things on uh, uh, TV, radio, news, whatever it may be. Right now, and I'm not going to ask anybody to do this, but if I were to ask every one of you to come up here and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ or share what you know about the current TV series you're watching, which could you do easier? Which would you know more? And that's not a shameful thing. Please hear my heart. The Lord is wooing you today to come closer to him. The Lord is wooing you today saying, I love you. I'm not mad at you. I desire you to hunger and thirst after me because I was hungry and thirsty for you. That's why I came at Christmas to go to the cross. It was for you because I love you, because I desire you. And nothing was going to keep me from winning you back, from wooing you back. He's speaking this to my heart while I'm laying in bed, and I'm like, okay, Lord, I don't have any notes on this. What am I going to do? He said, will you trust me? I said, I will trust you. But he was filling me up, and as I laid there, and he keeps pouring into me, he starts reminding me, increasing my hunger. He starts reminding me of, of the things that he's done in my life, and he said, share Holy Spirit testimonies. And I said, okay, but it's not my desire ever to preach myself. There's no fruit in that but to preach the Lord Jesus. But reminding us of the faithfulness and the goodness of our Lord Jesus Christ in our lives encourages us, builds faith, and increases hunger to the point where when I screw up, it doesn't push me away from him. It makes me want to go to his feet even more. And so he's reminding me how one Wednesday or Tuesday evening I was leaning up against that wall about where Megan is underneath that light because I was trying to read because the lights were down. And I was reading and I was reading and all of a sudden the Lord starts showing me in Isaiah 40, chapter 40, and chapter 41, and chapter 42, and I had a red pen, and if you look at my Bible today, it's all underlined, all these things about how the Lord is taking fear away. Fear not, fear not. I will uphold you with my mighty right hand. I will help you. I will strengthen you. Fear not. 
I am with you. I go before you. Fear not. And he just, I'd never seen it before so clearly. And I read three chapters in like 10 minutes, and I'm just over there. And I'm like, oh, and it just started burning inside of me. The Holy Spirit was lighting a flame under Isaiah 40, Isaiah 41, and Isaiah 42. And I knew in my heart that there was somebody that was at that prayer meeting. <clears throat> I won't mention the name. And they were struggling with fear that was gripping their lives to a debilitating degree. And I'm like, oh, man. But I always question in myself whether I'm hearing from the Lord or not. So I'm like, Lord, I'd, I don't want to go up there because she was asking if people want to say something. I'm like, I don't want to go up there. I don't want to say anything because what if I'm wrong? And then I said, and I'm just sitting there, and I'm looking down at my Bible, you know, like I want to do. And I'm leaning against the wall, and I'm just like this. You know how if the teacher's going to call on you, the first thing every student does is they look down. And so I'm looking down. I don't want to get called on. And I finally said to the Lord, I said, Lord Jesus, if this is something you want to share, then have Cherie, that was who was leading the meeting at times, so this was years and years and years and years ago, have Cherie give me the service. And next thing I know, I hear from the microphone, uh, Kenny, do you have something? <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. But the Holy Spirit was speaking to my heart, speaking to her heart, and I went up there and I just read. I didn't expound, I just read the things that I underlined. And it ministered to the person who was struggling with debilitating fear in their life. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. If we're not hungry and thirsty for the Lord, though, guess what? We're not at the prayer meeting. If we're not hungry and thirsty for the Lord to be his disciple, guess what? We're not reading our Bible. If we're not hungry and thirsty for the things of the Lord to be his disciple, we're not praying prayers like, Lord God, if it's you, then make it so. And if we're not hungry and thirsty for the Lord, we won't just bow out when he actually calls us on it. We'll get up and share the word. This happened again just, I don't know, last year. Actually, it was January, almost a year ago. This has never happened before. I've been going here for 20, 2002, 22 years almost. At the end of this year, it'll be 22 years. And I was sitting somewhere over here, and Pastor Adam was preaching, and, and he said something, and all of a sudden, the Lord started filling my heart again with, with a word. I'm like, no, Lord, that, now's not the time. Pastor Adam's preaching. And I'm like, well, maybe it is the time because you're greater than, than him preaching uh, or anybody preaching, praise God. And so I started writing down little notes in my Bible, and I'm like, and it, but it was burning with me, like with this extra little, like, kick in the rear from the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, it's like okay, well, Lord, if you want this to be said, I'm not going to interrupt the service. I don't do that. Have Pastor Adam call on me and give me the service. And what did he do? Five minutes later, out of nowhere, he goes, Hey, Pastor Kenny, do you have something that you want to share? Come up here and take the service. I said, Really? That's what I said. That was my response. Really? I don't know if you're there, if you remember that. I said, Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, I do. I was just praying to the Lord. If he wants to share this, you had me call me up here. And he called me up here. That's the Holy Spirit. But that only comes if we're willing while the word is being preached to listen to the word himself. If he's speaking to you right now, by all means, listen to him. Write down what he's telling you. Because that matters even more. I never forget as a 10-year-old little boy sitting in a service. I see we were standing, we were worshiping, and I was holding my mom's hand, and this uncontrollable weeping came over me like I'd, like I'd never experienced before. And I just started crying, and I felt the tangible presence of the Lord for the first time in my life at 10 years old as a little boy. And he ministered to me, and he just covered me in oil. My mom did the greatest spiritual thing that she ever could have done. My brother asked, what's wrong with him? Big brothers are often full of compassion, right, and kindness. I said, what's wrong with him? Dude, and my mom just said to him, leave him alone. He's being ministered to. And the Lord just ministered to me. I, he didn't say a word, but there was such a tangible presence and feeling by the Holy Spirit on my life that I couldn't do anything. So I grabbed my mom's hand, and I just wept. When I was in college, one of my roommates died. He didn't die. One of my roommates' father died of a massive heart attack suddenly. He came to live with us my second year of college at Purdue. And he was a non-believer. And he was not dealing with it well. He was dealing with it through pornography, and he was dealing with it through alcohol, and he was dealing with it through girls that he was trying to chase down on campus. He didn't know what to do. He was lost. His mom didn't know what to do either. She was hosting parties for all these college kids who were underage, and, and they were all getting drunk together, coping with the pain. And it grieved my heart because I knew in my soul that there was a better way, and that way is Jesus Christ. And I went to my old church, and, and, and nobody was there. And I, and I went in there, and, and my old church had a balcony that, that um, seated, you know, 
hundred people or so. And, and I went up the balcony, went up the back way, and I went in the second row of the balcony, and I just started weeping and grieving and crying, and my heart hurt so bad. Have you ever been in a place where you cried to where it was painful? And the Lord was showing me that I was weeping and travailing for his pain because he wasn't dealing with it. And I started this deep intercession in my life that I'd never had and nor have I had since then to that point. But the Holy Spirit just came over me and he was revealing to me that I was to be covering my roommate because he was a lost soul and he needed to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And I went back to Purdue that year and he lived with us for a second year and I ministered to him. And I spoke of the Lord Jesus, and my life was changed in front of him. And the things that I used to do, I didn't do anymore. And it was a testimony of the Lord Jesus in my life that he could also have in his life to minister to him. I wish he would have gotten saved at that point. I wish he would have turned his life around in that moment. But I was obedient and faithful. But as a disciple of Jesus Christ, if we're not hungry and thirsty for the things of him, he's not going to put the burden of the ones he loves on you to care for. Look, as an under-shepherd, my heart and desire is for all of you. He's the shepherd. But as disciples of Jesus, are we hungering and thirsty for the things of the Lord? If we're not, how are we going to grow? How are we going to be discipled? How are we going to hear him when he speaks to us through his word? We had an encounter night. I've not spoken of this publicly. She has because it's her testimony. As we were worshiping the Lord, I felt the Lord put it on my heart so greatly. I believe it was a word of knowledge about a liver being healed of psoriasis. And so I just released that. I said, I don't know who this is or who it may not be, but I said, I, I feel like, does, does anyone have a liver that needs to be healed? And Carolyn Millard, she's not here today. She's not feeling well. Her and Charlie are overcoming sickness at home. And she came up, and I prayed for her. I don't even know what I prayed. Why? Because it's not about my prayer. That's irrelevant. She grabbed a hold of my faith, what the Lord was speaking, and she was healed, and she started eating meat again, something she hadn't eaten in a very long time because of her liver that was screwed up. You can ask her about it, and she'll tell you about the healing the Lord did in her life, the medicine she does no longer take, the food she's allowed to eat now because it doesn't mess her up. But if we're not seeking the Lord, if we're not willing to hear from him and step out and take a risk for the Lord as his disciple, if we're not hungering and thirsting for the things of him, he's not going to entrust us with those things. And these are just a few spirit, uh, Holy Spirit stories that are not special to me. I wish there was so many more of them. I was met by a lady outside of the sanctuary uh, one Sunday afternoon. She was a non-believer. She still is a non-believer. And... Um, I had spoken from the platform, I was preaching, and I said, you know what, I just really believe right now somebody has a massive splitting headache, and the Lord wants to heal and wants to touch you, will you raise your hand, and let me pray for you, and she didn't raise her hand, because she was the first time in our church, and she was not a believer, and she was, says, I was no way I was coming forward to let you pray for me in that church, that's what she told me at, outside there in the, the lobby, but that was me, she goes, how did you know, I said, I didn't know. But the Lord knows you, and he loves you, and he's letting you know right now that his love is for you. He knows where you're at and what you're going through. Can I pray for you? And she let me pray for her out there in, this, in the lobby. Why am I sharing these Holy Spirit testimonies? I'm sharing them because I believe the Lord told me to share them with you, because faith needs to rise in this house to trust in the Lord, to go after him with all that we have. And this needs to be a culture, spirit of life, that hungers and thirsts for the Lord Jesus the hungers and thirsts for his righteousness so that he will become to the place where he can trust us because we trust him. I believe things don't happen as much as they should according to this scripture because there's so much in here that I have not seen but I know is the word of God. I'm waiting for one of you to walk on water. I want to be there when you do. Just let me know when you try it out. Why? Because it's in his word. That's why. I want to be there when somebody lays on a dead body and breathes into him and that body comes back to life. Why? Because it's in his word and I want to see it and I want to know it. But in order for him to do it, can he trust us with it? Because if he can't trust us with it, he's not going to do it because we will pervert it. We will monetize it. We will make it a way and a path to come to Spirit of Life Church. That's the last thing that I want and it's the last thing that he wants. 
We have to come to the place of hungering and thirsting for the Lord where we can go up to somebody and say, Nathan, you're going to change the world for the Lord God. And that means just as much as me telling you your address. That we, get, we, 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 we stop being wowed by the truth of the word of God. But it comes from a lack of hunger. It comes from a lack of thirsting. And we all want these wonderful things that minister healing to people. Why? Because they're seen, because they can be known and makes us feel good about ourselves. But what about hungering and thirsting for the Lord Jesus so that we can be corrected? Last week, Pastor Adam brought a word of correction. Did we change? Because if we didn't change, then we weren't good ground for that seed to be sown in that bore fruit. When I was in college, I remember going up to uh, Purdue to the Union, and, and in one of the towers, there was a prayer room, and it, it wasn't a prayer room. It had a stage. I don't know what they did up there, a theater or something. It sat hundreds of people. But we would go up there, and there would be 50 of us in our campus group, and we would have prayer meeting on Sunday nights. And so I would drive back from my home, and I would go there for a prayer group. And I remember sitting in this prayer group in these tables, and we would have some worship, just an acoustic guitar. And then us college kids would get together in groups of 10, and we would pray. And I remember sitting there, the, the first time that we sat there and prayed, and they made us hold hands. Oh, it's my least favorite thing to do in prayer. I don't see it in Scripture, but that's okay. So, Diane and I share that. I, I think it's great. <laughs> I don't want to hold your hand just to pray. It's okay. I'd rather pray like this, you know, or pray like this, or just not hold your hand. Um, but anyway, but we would hold hands, and we would sit and hold hands, and we would pray. And I always sat with guys. It's not like I could even meet any girls holding hands. Isn't that the worst? Because I wasn't with anybody at the time. So I would hold hands with the guys. But I remember sitting there, and, and when every time they would come to me to pray, because we just go in a circle, they said, if you don't want to pray, just squeeze the hand twice, and it will pass you. And so for the first few weeks, I would just squeeze the hand twice, and it would pass me. Because I didn't want to pray out loud. I was terrified of, of people, and I didn't want to pray out loud. But then, all of a sudden, something came over me one week, and I prayed. And I was reading my Bible more, and I was pressing the Lord, and I was hungry and thirsty for the Lord, and I didn't squeeze the hand twice. I actually prayed out. And then I was like, oh, man, I, I can do it. I prayed out. Next week, I prayed out again. The third week, I couldn't wait for it to get to me because I didn't like the other people's prayers, and I knew I had a better prayer. <laughs> Three weeks from fear of man, which is a sin, to pride, which is also a sin. <laughs> the Lord spoke to me, then, and he said, I don't want you to pray anymore. I'm like, what? I'm just now praying. I can never pray out loud. But he spoke to me because I was hungry for the Lord. I was in his word. I wanted to go to prayer group. I was driving back uh, uh, to Purdue, missing things at home just to be in prayer group so I could pray. He goes, I don't want to pray because your heart's wrong now. You're doing it out of pride. What was he doing? What's he still doing? Discipling me. He's discipling me. And as he disciples me, I become his disciple. And it increases my hunger and thirst for him. So it's true, you can go from one sin to another, even in a prayer group. Oh, man. But the Lord will not leave you there, because if your heart is after chasing Him, He will lead you into righteousness, and you will be filled. I remember sitting over there in that same wall. That wall has been good to me over the years. And I was here by myself, and I was preparing for a message, and I was praying, and I was praying, and I was praying, and I was reading my Bible. And all of a sudden, I've been spilled, filled with the Spirit for a long time. I can't tell you the exact date. We pray for it every week at church. So I can't, I can't tell you. <laughs> I wish I could tell you. I know it's happened because the Lord has rebuked me on it when I didn't believe it. But I was praying over there, and I was praying in the Spirit, and all of a sudden, as I was praying in the Spirit, in an unknown language, speaking the mystery, the perfect will of the Lord, as the Bible says, a new language started coming out of my mouth. And I'm not talking French or Portuguese or Spanish. But it was a different tongue I'd never heard before. Look, I've heard myself pray in the Spirit for years. But I was so hungry for the Lord that he gave me a new language. And it was a deeper language. And it was a language, as soon as it came out of my mouth, flooded my body, my personal physical flesh, with the most glorious peace I had not felt in a very long time. And I remember telling, again, Sri about it. This was, again, this was over 10 years ago. And I never forgot that when the Lord touched me. But why did he touch me? I'm not special. My kids will tell you. <laughs> The people I taught with will tell you. I'd rather hide in a corner than be seen. But there, when you hunger and thirst for the Lord, He will fill you to the degree that you are hungering and thirsting. If you're this hungry for the Lord, He will fill you this much. If you're this hungry for the Lord, He will fill you this much. The hungering and the thirsting is on our part. 
And if you don't hunger and thirst for the Lord right now and these experiences that I'm telling you, and by the way, my experiences pale in comparison to most, but they're mine. The Lord has been intimate with me. Every single one of the experiences I just shared with you was a kiss from the Lord. It says in the Song of Solomon that the woman went out to the streets because the one she loved had left, and she was searching everywhere for him. Why? Because she was hungry and thirsty for his companionship. Are you searching everywhere for him so that you can be discipled, that you can be his disciple, not a churchgoer? It's Christianity. It's not, it's not churchianity. It's not about going to church, although we need to go to church. It says, do not forsake the gathering together of the believers. You need to be here because we counsel one another. We sharpen one another because there's a corporate anointing that he pours out his presence for the benefit of you because of the sacrifice of another. You don't always get that at home. Because you haven't made that sacrifice. I don't always get that at home because I haven't made that sacrifice. But when the Lord draws us and he ministers to us, it just draws us to want to hunger more. It says you will be filled, not satisfied. In other words, that word filled is in the present. Um, I forget the tense that it's in, but it means being filled. It's a continual process of being filled. So the more you hunger, the more you're filled. The more you thirst, the more you're filled. The more you de- desire him. And God can do amazing and wonderful things. I'll never forget the testimony of Reinhard Bonnke. The Lord was sharing this with me, reminding me of it during worship this morning. He was in Norway, I believe, and he was, uh, I could get the country wrong, but I think that was right. And he was preaching to a church, and in the church was all old people. Now, if you don't know Reinhard Bonnke, he was an evangelist in Africa and, and, and in Europe and, and all over the world, but he loved ministering to young people in their 20s. And this church, he said the youngest person was like 50-something, and that wasn't young to him. He's like, when church is over, he went to the ministry, he brought him there, and says, where's the young people? I need young people. <clears throat> he goes, come with me, I'll show you. And they drove to a warehouse district, and one of the warehouses had been turned into a massive disco club. I just told you the time frame, it must have been the 70s, right? <laughs> and he went in there, and he saw hundreds and hundreds, thousands, he might have said, of people dancing to the disco songs. And it broke his heart because what they thought was life and their drugs and their, and their drinking and their dancing, he's like, they don't have life. So he found the owner of the disco club and he said, can I come back tomorrow and preach to these kids? And the disco owner looked at him and said, you're nuts, get out of here, you whack job. He goes, no, I, I make money because they come in to dance to disco, not to listen to sermons. He goes, You look out there and tell me if you see life in any of those young people dancing to your disco. He says this to the disco owner. That's boldness. That's someone who's hungry and thirsting after the Lord and the things of the Lord, which are the young people. Those who are unsaved, those who are unchurched. And the disco owner looked at him and he says, you're nuts. They're not going to listen to you. They're not here for that. And Reinhardt looks back at him and goes, just give me five minutes. Five minutes. And he goes, okay, you have five minutes. He said immediately, he was pricked in his heart, why did I only ask for five minutes? What am I going to do in five minutes? So he went away, and he came back the next day, and he walks into the same disco bar, and the owner was true to his word. He said, you have five minutes. They shut down the music of the disco bar, of the, of the warehouse, the disco club. And Reinhardt Bunky got on the loudspeaker where the DJ was, and he goes, everybody sit down. So everybody sat down where they were. They had no idea what was going on. And he had five minutes, he took five minutes to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation, the gospel, Romans 1, 16. And he preached the gospel of Jesus to them in five minutes. Changed lives. Some were weeping. Some received it. But after five minutes, everybody stood up, music went on, they danced again. He left Norway. He came back a year later to by the same pastor, brought him the pastor of the old church. <laughs> and at, when the p- pastor picked him up from the airport, he goes, Reiner, I have to show you something. He says, okay. And he drives him back to the warehouse dis- district, and it's coming back to his remembrance that this is the disco club that he went to. And when he pulled up to the warehouse district, and he looked at the warehouse disco club, it no longer said warehouse district club or whatever it was. It said warehouse church. And he walked into that place, and he couldn't believe what he was seeing, even though he was the one who preached there. And when he walked in the door, this 
young person walked up to him, ran up to Ron Bunky, goes, do you remember me? Do you remember me? You preached the gospel in five minutes, and I was the DJ that night. And then another one ran up to him who was on staff there and said, do you remember me? I was one of the servers there that night. And what used to be a disco club, it turned into a church full of young people because he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. That doesn't happen unless we're his disciple, unless we are hungering and thirsting after him. Because when we are hungering and thirsting after him, that means we have emptied ourselves of self, and he fills us with himself, and we can be trusted with the things of the Lord in the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? It says in Psalm 34, Taste and see that the Lord, he is good. His presence, being with him, wherever he is, that is our spiritual food. That is what he desires for our lives. That is the culture I want to see Spirit of Life Church change into and become. A church that is hungry for the world. A church that is hungry for the lost. But first and foremost, a church that is hungering and thirsting for him who is our righteousness who is our redemption, who is our sanctification, who is our wisdom. If he's our wisdom, that means all else knowledge you're seeking after is foolishness. It's garbage. Now, I love nerd shows. Anybody here watch any nerd shows? I know you do, Ashley. We watch Expedition Unknown. It's great. You know what else I watch? The men who built America, the titans who built America, the engineering that built America. You see, there's a theme here, right? All nerd shows, I love that kind of knowledge. I love historical knowledge. But in the sight of Jesus Christ, who is wisdom to me, it is foolishness. This morning, I was given a science lesson of weather to Kendall and Megan as we drove to church. I'm sure that, did you like it, honey? Yeah, sure. <laughs> she said, sure. It was great. But it's still in there, and I haven't taught that since 2002, that, or 2003 maybe. But it's in there, but it doesn't matter. Nobody cared. It's all right. It made me feel good for a moment. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. Let's look at Jesus discipling. And if we, as we hunger and thirst after him. Is, is this good for anybody? Is it okay to share testimonies of the Lord? Look, and I, I have more. I'm not going to share them. I would love to. I'd love to hear yours. And we have tons in this church. We don't have, you don't have to knock on doors every week to testify the Lord. You can do it wherever you go. But I would tell you what, there's fruit of those knocking on the doors. There's fruit of going out and ministering the gospel in that way. We have to be people of doing. People of doing. But we're not going to be, that was the speaker turning off, my phone shut down. We are not going to be a church of doing if we're not a church of disciples. We have to be a church of disciples. Matthew chapter 17 verse 1 says this. This is the beautiful account of the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. Where the glory of God Almighty, who was clothed in skin, begins to show through that skin. Verse seven, or chapter 17, verse 1. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, <clears throat> and brought them up into a high mountain apart. Okay, that's annoying. And brought them up into a high mountain apart. Jesus took Peter, James, and John and separated them. That's the word apart. Brought them up to the high mountain. One of the first things of discipling, of being his disciple, of discipleship in his presence, is being separated. Jesus separates us to himself. He took Peter, James, and John and separated them. Look, I could stand up here and tell you pornography is bad, and it is. I can stand up here and tell you that partying and getting drunk and hitting your wife and, and screaming at your kids is bad, and it is. I can stand up here and I can tell you that the Lord has a plan for your life, and he does. But I believe that every life application message bows its knee at the feet of Jesus Christ. If we are separated and walking with Jesus Christ, beholding him, we are changed from glory to glory. And by beholding him and gazing at him eternally, we don't have the desire for pornography. We don't have the desire to kick the dog, to beat our children. We don't have the desire to yell at our mom and not offer forgiveness or repent of sin because we're walking with the Lord Jesus. We'll know his plans for our life because we're gazing at him. Every sin I have ever committed from yesterday or this day on past has committed 
by one reason. I turned my eyes from Jesus. I was no longer gazing at the one who loves me, the one who died for me. We are to present ourselves a living sacrifice unto the Lord God Almighty. That means that we put ourselves on an altar. I want you to get that mental image. If I lay myself on an altar, I'm laying on my back, my hands crossed, and I'm just looking straight up. I have nothing else to look at if I'm on the altar but him who is my righteousness, who is my sanctification, my holiness, my pure way of living. I know how to live pure. Gazing at him answers every do and don't question I ever have in my life. Whatever it may be, whatever you're struggling with, gaze at him. Spend more time with him. Allow him to separate you unto himself, to take you up with him unto the mountain, and you will have the answer to the do's and don'ts in your lives. I can't preach them forever. It would take too long. New issues arise every day. Should I look like TikTok? Should I look at Instagram? How much time should I scroll? I heard a preacher say it quickly. How about you just look at this scroll instead of scrolling on your phone? This will have more life in it. I can't answer every issue. (laughs) Men painting their nails. I have no idea. I'm not going to do it. Is it a sin? I don't think so. I wouldn't do it. People argue that it's just like getting a tattoo. I don't, people, there's an argument about that too. I don't know all these answers. Here's what I do know. When I look at the Lord Jesus Christ, he answers it for me. And he puts in him, he puts his desires in me, and his desires become my desires. And most of those things aren't even worth giving two thoughts about, let alone one. That's my heart. That's my heart for us to be his disciple. In order for us to be his disciple, we must separate ourselves unto the Lord Jesus Christ. He took Peter, James, and John with him up into his presence. They beheld him as they walked with him. Step number two. Verse two. I'm sorry, not verse two. He separated them, and he brought them up to the mountain. Number one, for us to be discipled by Jesus, he separates us to him. Number two, He must be the leader. He's the one who leads us. The number one thing that we can sow, the number one seed into our relationship with Jesus Christ is time with him. And not just any time, time in his presence. What's time in his presence? Time reading his word. Oh man, I hate reading his word. Then you don't love Jesus. That's too strong, Pastor. It's not too strong. It's biblical. You can't know Jesus who the scriptures speak of without knowing the scripture. We got to stop thinking our Bible is our Bible and we just come to it five minutes a day and then we go live our life. The Bible is his life to our life. He leads us. He leads us up the mountain. What's the number one way he's going to lead us? Through his word. Well, I pray a lot. That's fantastic. But even just praying without being grounded in the word, you could be led astray and turn into some mystic, weird, who knows what but we are grounded and established in the face of Jesus as we look into this, as we see him rightly in his word. He leads us. We have to know his word. The Lord has put it on my heart this year to read the Bible through multiple times. Just so you know, I already told you this. I finished reading the Bible through in December. That took me a year and a half at the rate that I was doing it because I study other things also. I believe he wants me to read through the Bible this year three times. That means that by the end of January, I have gone through the New Testament. And by the end of March, I'll have gone through the Old Testament. And then I will start over. Why? Because I spend too much time playing games. Can we just get real? I love playing games. Games are fun. What games do you play, Pastor? Oh, I mainly play board games without the board against people all around the world on the Internet. Like Ticket to Ride. Anybody ever played Ticket to Ride? It's a train game. I like it. You know there's a website you can play it with other people around the world? I do. <laughs> How about there's a game called Stonehenge? I like it. Or Stone Age. I play that one too. It's a board game. But I like spending time playing it. I don't know why. It's just fun. It's, it's, it's just something that I do. You know what? I can tell you too much about Fox News right now, and I don't want to know that anymore. You know, there's an election coming, and we're going to get bombarded with even more and more and more stuff about political figures. I don't really care anymore. You're like, well, wait a minute, Pastor. The last time you spoke all these things and you were in, look, they're not the answer. Now, we need to vote. 
We need to vote according to Scripture, 100%. But we need to always keep our eyes on Jesus. Some old doddering man, which is not very respectful, or orange man bad, which is these are the derogatory terms for either candidate it's going to be, are not our Savior. They're just not. Do I have a preference? Yes, I do, because I'm a pro-lifer, 100%. And I'll never be ashamed of that. Life is life at conception. It's new DNA. It's a new cell. It's a new human being. If that, hum, if that cell dies, then a human being died. That's my viewpoint. That's also the biological viewpoint. It's also the scriptural viewpoint. And I vote that way. That's it. Enough said. I want to keep my eyes on Jesus throughout this whole process because there's going to be fear monger after fear monger after fear monger saying if this man wins, the country is doomed. And if this man wins or this woman wins, the country is doomed. Either way, the country is doomed. So hey, guess what? Let's just look at Jesus because we don't have to worry about it. And that we can be the shining light in this country. We can lift up the Lord Jesus Christ as his disciples. We can disciple this nation because this nation needs to be discipled now more than it ever has since its inception. Since the first man, first pastor on the first boat walked, he got on the shore of the United States of America. He bowed his knees. He put himself to the ground. He said, Lord Jesus, I claim this place to spread the gospel throughout the entire world. That's how this nation started, regardless of the garbage you hear. True story. That man died. Most people did when they came in that first boat. But he declared it for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was well before the pilgrims ever came. But we have to know that Jesus, he separates us to him, and then he is the one who leads us. But we have to get before him to pray, to submit to his will. What does he say? He says, go into your closet that's separating yourself and shut the door that's canceling the noise of the world to be with him. On Saturdays, I like to come to the church, and it's like, well, why? I have an office at home. I have an office at home, but does anybody ever hear talk through the vents at your house? Like you can hear through different rooms, through the vents? I can hear everything that Haley says in her bedroom in my office. Haley's not quiet sometimes. She's on the phone. She's not the loudest person in the world. No, that would definitely go to Noah or Megan. But I can hear everything she says. And then we have a basketball goal and a dartboard in the room next to my office. You know how loud that can be? So in order for me to go in my room and shut the door, it can't be in my house. It has to be here. And so I come here to the church to close the, ro the door and to shut out the noise to be with the Lord and allow him to lead me. Verse number 2, chapter 17. And Jesus was transfigured or changed or metamorphosed like a caterpillar coming to a butterfly before them. In other words, it's that process of changing. And the face of Jesus did shine as the sun, and his clothing was white as the light. After he separates us and leads us, here's the beauty of Jesus discipling us. We get revelation. There is something that Jesus wants to show you, and here's what it is. It is a greater revelation of his character and nature. That's the beauty of the Lord leading us. We get to see him rightly as he is, glorified before God, seated on the throne. We have to understand that when he separates and leads us, it's because he wants to give us a greater vision of himself. Wasamani says it this way. The way that God wants to give you is Christ. The truth that God wants to give you is Christ. And the life that God wants to give you is Christ Jesus. We see these aspects of him when we spend time with him, when we separate <clears throat> unto him and allow him to lead us. <clears throat> When we come unto God the Father, he gives us Christ. Verse 3, And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with them. Then answered Peter and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you will, let us make here three tabernacles or tents, one for you, Elijah, and Moses. Verse 5, While Peter was still speaking, even though he shouldn't have been, Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son. In whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were very afraid. Number one, Jesus separates us when he disciples us. Number two, he leads us. He's the shepherd. Number three, he gives us a greater revelation of himself. And number four, 
in his presence, we hear the voice of God. You want to hear the voice of God? How much time are you spending in the presence of Jesus? It says in Hebrews chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Jesus Christ is the express image of God the Father. It is in the face of Jesus that we know God our Father. Spending time with the face of Jesus is hearing the voice of our Father. How do we spend time in the face of Jesus? Behold Him. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Behold Him. As in a mirror, seeing the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, so that you would be changed from glory to glory. That's how. And we hear the voice of God speaking to our hearts, speaking to our lives. And then something beautiful happens. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their face and they were afraid. This is the proper response to the voice of the Lord, to worship. We're never more humble than we are adoring Jesus. When we humble ourselves, that is an attractive place for the Lord to come and rest. Think about Bethany, the town where Mary was at his feet listening to his word. She humbled himself. It says Jesus rested at Bethany. If you humble yourself, he will be there and you will be in his presence. When we start to do it on our own and not be discipled by him, he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. It says in James. And then it says this, verse 7, And Jesus came and touched them. How many of you want to be touched by the Lord? Anybody want to be touched by Jesus? Are we spending time in his presence? Are we allowing him to lead us? Are we separating ourselves? Are we listening to the Father speak as we behold the face of Jesus in his word? If we are, we're promised the touch from the Lord Jesus. And that touch in the voice of God, which says, hear ye him. When we hear the voice of God, what is it saying? This is my son, Jesus. Behold, listen to him. Kendall, please come help me. And then he touches us. I told you this when we were at the pastor's conference. It was so beautiful. We had spent the week seeking the Lord. We actually put fuel to our hunger and thirst, Kendall and I. And we are blessed because the church helped us out tremendously to go to this pastor's conference. 5,000 pastors, ministers, servants of the Lord seeking him. Two, four, five, ten different preachers listening to. And then we stayed and we went on Sunday morning to church morning and night. Why? Well, we went to Florida. We separated ourselves from our normal wayside, the normal road that we traveled here in Indiana. Why? So we could be good ground to receive from the Lord. And as we went down to Florida, our heart's preparation was simple. It wasn't to be equipped to come back here to lead you guys. It wasn't to be equipped to come back here to grow this church. And I want to give you a heads up. I'm, my main goal in life is not growing Spirit of Life Church. My main goal in life is ministering to the Lord Jesus who builds his own church. Matthew chapter 16. That's my goal. You want to see Spirit of Life Church grow? Are you being fed here? Are you being ministered to here? If so, then invite others to come and feed and be ministered to. You win the lost. It's not incumbent upon me or Pastor Adam or any staff member or elder to go out and win all the lost. That's not in Scripture. We're all to do the work of an evangelist. We're all to go out and win the lost. That's you. It's you at your workplace. It's you in your home. It is also me. But we went down there for one reason. That was to spend time with the Lord, to minister to his feet, to wash his feet, to kiss him, to love on Jesus. And it was so beautiful because the very last moment of the very last day on Sunday, and I shared this already, we were exhausted. And there's no word that even went forth that Sunday night because all the preachers had taken off because they were exhausted. And the Lord gave me this picture of him so beautifully, of his face and this tear coming down his face. And I'll never forget it. It touched me so deeply. And I've never forgotten it. And I won't. And he spoke to my heart so tenderly. And I said, Lord, I love you. He said, I'm so pleased with what you guys are doing. 
And then he spoke to my heart again and he said, how many times does this tear come down my face because I wouldn't forgive or because I sinned or because I wouldn't come to him? That broke my heart in the most tender, loving way. The only way that Jesus can because he's beautiful and he loves you and he's not mad at you. Please stand with me. All he wants from you, are you ready? You know there's a book out there called The Purpose Driven Life. When I got to the end of it, I was dissatisfied because I didn't feel it gave me my purpose. Well, let me tell you, I found the purpose for every single person. I can solve all your issues right now. Do you believe me? (laughs) Do I believe me? Here's the answer. Jesus wants one thing from you. This is your purpose. The one thing that Jesus wants from you is you. That's it. He wants you. I'm a screw up. I mess up every day. Join the club. He wants you. He wants your life. He wants your love. And he deserves it. Because he gave you him. The God's love. The Father's love to you. My prayer this morning as a prayer team, please go ahead and come on up. I, 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 had, I was going to preach the gospel message at the end of this. But it's amazing how when you have no notes, you can go longer than you normally do. But today is the day of salvation for you. Jesus Christ, a real God-man who came to earth as God, clothed himself in the flesh of man, born of a virgin, lived a sinless, perfect life. Why? For you. Because he loves you. Because he wants your heart. He wants all of you. He wants your mind. He wants your soul. He wants you to spend eternity with him. You are the reward for his suffering on the cross because he went to that cross. And today you can make a decision to stop loving the things that put the holes in his hands. Today you can make that decision. If you say you love him, then stop. And come to him. And give yourself to the one who is perfect, who died, who took the nails, who took the thorns, who took the spear, who took the shame and the guilt and the condemnation, which was not his, it was ours. And he died, and he went to hell, and he plundered it. He destroyed every work of Satan. There is victory over sin today through Jesus Christ, who loves you. And he rose again on the third day. He walked around quite a bit. Over 500 people saw him and professed and testified of his risen. And then he ascended to God, glorified now, in heaven, still in a body we would recognize. And he's sitting, and he's interceding on behalf of you and I. And he's going to return for his bride, pure and spotless. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is it. And it's glorious, and it'll change your life. Today, if you are in a dark pit of sin, you can come out. Come meet him. Come know him. He's calling you to separate yourselves to him. But are you hungry? Are you thirsty to be his disciple? Jesus, I love you, and I thank you for this day thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth that is your word. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you long to shepherd us. Lord, that we would allow you. Jesus, that we would come to you today and lay our lives down for you. Lord Jesus, if there is someone here today who longs and desires, with every head bowed and every eye closed, to be your child, to be your disciple, who doesn't know you, who is stuck in cycles of sin, Lord Jesus, Would you minister to the heart right now? If that is you, if you're feeling inside, just, I don't know, that that, an uneasiness, or, or is he looking at me? Look, I'm not looking at you. But it says that you shouldn't be ashamed because he wasn't ashamed. He went and took your shame. If that's you today, put up, are you willing to testify before God and man, Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? Would, Would you put up your hand today? to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. A gospel that can change your soul. It's Him. And then there's another one I want to speak to is we are to examine ourselves to see whether we're in faith or not, it says in 2 Corinthians. Today, as I was speaking about hungering and thirsting after the Lord, about His desire to take you away, His desire to lead you, His desire to reveal Himself to you and to touch you, If you don't have that desire, if you're not hungry and thirsty and you long 
for a greater hunger in your life, with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you slip up your hand and testify that you want to increase in your hunger and thirst for the Lord Jesus Christ? That you want to increase in your hunger and thirst for his righteousness, for the things of the Lord. Look, I have my hands raised, both. Jesus, today, Lord, for every hand that you see lifted up, and I thank you for them. Lord, for everyone who is hungering and thirsting for a greater revelation of you, to be led away by you, to be touched by you, to be ministered, to hear the voice of God Almighty, who again points us to you, Jesus, to be touched by you. Lord, would you make it so, even now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you touch every hungering and thirsting heart that we would taste and see that you are good. Jesus, and I pray right now for those who didn't raise their hands. Lord, that you would arrest their soul. Lord, that you would put in them a hunger and a desire for the things of righteousness that they would be filled. That they may think they know what is filled now, but they have no idea how empty that we truly are without your presence, Jesus. And so I pray in my life, Lord Jesus, that everything I hunger and thirst for that is outside of you and your desires for my life, would fade away and be replaced by a hunger and thirst for you alone, Jesus. Amen. As the prayer team is up here, if you would like to come and be prayed for, we would love to minister to you. We would love to pray for you. If not, I just thank you for coming. I bless you. I love you. I pray you have a wonderful, glorious week. And that the Lord will reveal his heart to you in a new way as you draw close to him throughout this week. In Jesus' name. Amen. Go have a wonderful day and be blessed.